This is going to give you a lot to think about. You've got to start thinking, how much of this evangelical culture have I absorbed? Am I using to suppress what is actually just written plainly right there in the scriptures? Because that's how it works. And you really have to work through that. Ask God to show this to you, to reveal this to you, and to help uproot it out of you. Because if you don't, you will not be saved. You're following a false gospel. So you may recognize this man. Some of you might. Frank Turek. And um, he usually debates on campuses, but sometimes he'll debate some famous person like Hitchens. Now, you're probably asking, why are we looking at a video by Frank Turek? The reason is that Frank Turek is usually wrong, and he is espousing the apostate church's gospels, and that he is a prime example of the evangelical culture that I warn you about that replaces the Bible with memes and jokes and cute phrases. And then you get Christians all over repeating these cute phrases or what they think are smart phrases in order to justify their view of the Bible, which is wrong. A wrong view, apostate view of the Bible. They use these cute memes and, and phrases and turn, uh, turns of phrases in order to do that. And they think they're right. They think that that proves their view is right about the Bible. So, let's get into this. I'm going to show you how it works. Since I have mentioned this many times to many people here on the channel, I'm now using an example to show you the evangelical culture and how it creates this monstrosity that is contradicting God. In fact, what is the biggest objection you get if you're a Christian? What do people say about Christians in general? You're a hypocrite! Now, when somebody calls you a hypocrite, you know what I think you ought to say? At least two things. Number one, you're right. So? <laughs> what follows from that? I don't live up to my standards. Do you live up to yours? You realize that nobody lives up to their standards. Nobody is completely consistent all the time. We're all fallen. So, I don't know if you noticed his sleight of hand that he did there, which is very common for Frank Turek. And if you're on the ball and paying attention, you'll notice him doing it all the time. He does these sleight of hands in order to win an argument with those who are not as attentive. But if you've been watching my false teacher and false prophet videos, you'll know that it won't get past me. All right, so let's go ahead and have a look at what he's just said and analyze it. There are some problems with it. He said that the way that you should answer someone who says that Christians are hypocrites is to say, yeah, so what? That you're a hypocrite. Now, when somebody calls you a hypocrite, you know what I think you ought to say? At least two things. Number one, you're right. So? All right, so he's admitting to being a hypocrite himself. Because he's teaching those people to accept and acknowledge their hypocrisy. You notice that? Because if they're not hypocrites, and he's telling them to admit that they're hypocrites, he's teaching them to lie, which is a sin, a grave sin. Revelation 21.8, Jesus says, All liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is written to Christians. So you who believe in once saved, always saved, you better wake up. Because all of these writings are written to Christians in the New Testament. It's not to unbelievers, it's to Christians. All right. So he's teaching them to call themselves a hypocrite, whether they are or are not. He has the assumption that everyone is a hypocrite. Every Christian, every non-Christian, everyone's a hypocrite. I'm going to read to you a chapter in Romans, a whole chapter. It's a short one, but you will see that Paul absolutely disagrees with this. You're right. So? Here's a problem. Not only did he just teach them to embrace being a hypocrite, but they also, he also taught them that it doesn't matter. I'm going to read to you four quick verses here. 
This is from Job 15.34. For the congregation of hypocrites shall be desolate, and fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. Isaiah 10.6. I will send him against the hypocritical nation, and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil, and to take the prey, and to tread them down like a mire in the streets. Jeremiah 42, 20 and 22. For you dissembled in your hearts when you sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God, and according to all that the Lord our God shall say, so declare to us and we will do it. They didn't. Matthew 24, 51. And shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you think that God accepts your hypocrisy? Do you think God wants you to stay a hypocrite? Absolutely not. But Frank, Frank Turek, because he's an apostate teacher, he thinks that everyone not only has sinned, but continues to sin and cannot stop sinning as long as they're in the body. Ring a bell? I've told you this one over and over again, that this is probably the biggest heresy today in the churches, that I cannot help but sin as long as I'm in the body or in the flesh, they'll, they'll say sometimes. But Frank believes that, and that's coming through, because he's telling you just to admit that you're, you're a hypocrite, and to say, so what? Like, God doesn't care about it. So what? Then let's look at the next part of his uh, teaching. What follows from that? I don't live up to my standards. Do you live up to yours? You realize that nobody lives up to their standards. That's not true. He said nobody lives up to their standards. Paul said that we must live up to what we've already obtained. Attained. That's the expectation to do it. That you can do it and that people do it. He also mentions those of us who are perfect, or complete is literally what the word means. They are living according to their standards. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So Paul wasn't living up to his standards? Is that what uh, Frank is saying? It is what Frank's saying, but it's not what the Bible says. John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Well, two verses before it says, God is light, and in him there is no shady obscurity at all. It's literally what the word means in Greek darkness. In God, there's no shady obscurity, darkness at all. It's all light. And it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. Do you have fellowship with other Christians? Well, John says, no, if you are sinning. And he says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purges us of all sin, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, with no darkness at all. We have to stop sinning. We have to be sincere about repentance. Because repentance isn't something that's imaginary. Repentance is metanoia. Meta in the midst of. Noo means to exercise the mind. And so you're exercising the mind in the midst of each occasion, throughout each day, the rest of your life. It's a commitment to obey God. That's repentance. You're stopping your sin. If you're repenting of your sin, you're stopping your sin. You're not saying, well, I can't help but sin anyway while I'm in the body, so I'm asking for forgiveness of sins, but I don't have to stop it. That's not what the Bible says. So Frank doesn't think you can stop your sin, and therefore everyone is a hypocrite because no one can stop. But that's not the biblical message. That's the evangelical message, which is a parallel church, an apostate church, to the true church of God, who follows what really it says in the Bible. You've got to pay attention, because the most repeated warning to the Christian in the New Testament is, do not be deceived. How can you not be deceived if you're not paying close attention? You will be deceived, especially by men exactly like Frank Turek, who play a sleight of hand with words. What follows from that? I don't live up to my standards. Do you live up to yours? You realize that nobody lives up to their standards. Nobody is completely consistent all the time. We're all fallen. That means then, based on his assumption, that everyone 
will be cut up and assigned the place of hypocrites, because that's where hypocrites are. With weeping and gnashing of teeth, none will be saved, according to him. Now he's going to play this other thing, well, this imputation of Jesus' righteousness, which isn't in the Bible either. First time that that appears is with Erasmus at the Reformation, and he wasn't even a reformer. He was a cowardly Catholic who refused to join the reformers. But the reformers took that idea and ran with it, the mistranslation. It hadn't been translated that way before. So that was 1,500 years. It had not been translated like that. And then Erasmus translates it like that in an abusive way, because the Greek does not mean that. All right, let's keep going. We're all fallen. Second thing you... The question you should be asking there is, what do you mean by fallen, Frank? We're all fallen. Are we? Or were we? 2 Corinthians 5.17 contradicts Frank. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you've been reconciled with God through Christ, then you're a new creation, and the old things have passed away, including the fact that you had fallen in sin. You were no longer fallen if you were in Christ. You're not. You are no longer fallen if you were in Christ. In, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. Frank speaks as if he doesn't believe that all things have been made new and that old things have passed away and that we are a new creation in Christ. If we are in Christ, it says, if anyone is in Christ. Remember Romans 8, 1, the whole verse, because some of your Bibles cut off the last half, but it says it again in verse 3 or 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Then it defines what that means to be in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And Galatians 5.19 says, and the, the works of the flesh are evident, and then lists example sins. says, this is just an example. Sins are the works of the flesh. If you are walking in according to the flesh, in the flesh, you are sinning. If you're walking according to the Spirit, then you are demonstrating the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is what's mentioned next in Galatians 5. In contrast, in contradiction to the sin, you cannot have both. Jesus says it too. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Either you're bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, or you're bearing the works of sin. One or the other. But that's something that you have control over, especially when you become a Christian. So, you have to choose. I'm telling you what the Bible says. It's not what the evangelical culture teaches. And so that's why you may have something rise up inside of you saying, well, that's not true. That's not true. Or you might hear something inside of you say, well, that's works salvation. Well, this phrase itself, works salvation, is not in the Bible. It's not a biblical idea. This derogatory term, works salvation, is something created by the evangelical culture, actually even before that. But it's something that comes out of the evangelical culture as a criticism against those who are trying to do what the Bible says, trying to obey Jesus and please God the Father. Well, you'll know. You'll know just by a cursory reading of the Gospels, even the Sermon on the Mount, that we must please the Father who is in heaven in order for Jesus to acknowledge that he knows us. Because if you don't, if you are peddling lawlessness, that's what Jesus said, away from me, I never knew you, you toilers of lawlessness. That's exactly what it says. It wasn't because of anything else, great miraculous deeds that they were doing in Jesus' name. No, they were using that to try to justify themselves while they were disobeying. They were trying to do some miraculous works in order to make up for disobeying God. And Jesus said, no. You actually are not just disobeying God, but you are trying to teach others that they don't obey God. 
and therefore Christ never knew you. You want to be known by Christ. Then teach it you must obey. If you teach it you must not obey, or you don't have to obey, or you can't obey, Christ will say, I never knew you. You are not known by Christ. And in the end, you will not be saved. It says, uh, only he who pleases my Father in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. He will not. Let's get back to what Frank is saying. Standards. Nobody is completely consistent all the time. We're all fallen. So this issue here is also addressed in the chapter, even with people who are not believers. Second thing you can say, do you realize you've just given evidence for God? Why? Why is hypocrisy wrong if there is no God? Why is anything wrong if there is no God? Nothing's wrong if there's no God. There's no standard beyond ourselves that we're obligated to obey. You can't say anything's right or wrong. It's just your opinion. So That's not proof for God. He just proved that it's not proof for God. Because all they have to say is, well, it's my opinion. And it's the opinion of most people that hypocrisy is wrong. That we don't need God to provide that standard for us to believe that hypocrisy is wrong. So they can argue right exactly as Frank is arguing right here, that it's just your opinion. And they can say, well, based on statistics of our society, most people believe that hypocrisy is wrong. Therefore, hypocrisy is a standard that is wrong that's outside of myself. I'm telling you, he's using sleight of hand. And he's trying to do that in order to win an argument. In this case, he's just setting up a straw man and then knocking it down. Because that's a stupid thing to say. That is proof for God. It's not proof for God. Claiming foul because someone's being a hypocrite is not proof for God. And they could also point to uh, logic. They could say, well, you know, based on logic, which is something that is observable in the universe, that based on logic applied to these actions and words, that is illogical, and therefore that is a moral standard. So there are many ways you can go at that in order to dismantle Frank's flimsy straw man argument that is proof for God. What I'm saying is that he is a charlatan, and he's trying in different ways to try to deceive you. Let's keep going. So if you think there's something wrong with hypocrisy, you've just given evidence for God. No. Frank is either Frank. I can't really figure out whether Frank is being purposely deceitful or is just stupid. But I don't think he's so stupid. He's not very smart. I can see that by how he speaks and how he manages his information. But I think he's smart enough where he is just trying to manipulate. So I think it's a mixture of not being smart enough, but smart enough to manipulate. A number of years ago, I had a couple of debates with Christopher Hitchens, who was a brilliant British atheist who sounded more brilliant than he was because he had a British accent. So again, he's trying to use humor in order to slip things in for people to accept it. It lowers the guard. You see these debates on our YouTube channel, and he went on and on about how much evil religious people have done, to which I said to him, you know, you're right, Christopher, you have done, we have done a lot of evil, but you're proving our worldview. We admit we've done evil, that's why we need a savior. So he says, we admit that we've done evil. That's in the past. That's why we need a savior. Okay? But look, then he says, so this is, if you just take this out of context, it sounds like it's okay. Like, yeah, we admit that we've done evil in the past. And now we have a savior. We needed a savior because we did evil in the past. And, and now we don't. See, that's why it says we admit we've done evil. It implies that we're not doing evil now. But then he says... And I don't live up to the pure words of Christ evil either. I'm I don't live up to the pure words of Christ either. He's trying to use the word pure to describe Christ's words in order to fool you. He wants you to think that since Christ's words are pure, you have nothing to do with them. You can't possibly live up and fulfill the words of Christ. But if you go to Matthew to the very end, there's a thing called the Great Commission. It's where Jesus sends out the disciples. He says in verse 19, chapter 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing its ethnicities, literally, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This term, to observe all things, literally means to obey. So, teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. So, if you cannot obey all things that Christ has commanded us, then what? This is teaching them to obey. That means they're able to obey because you're able to teach them to do that. So, Frank, claiming that he doesn't live up to the pure words of Jesus means that he disobeys Christ, and he disobeys what's written in the Scriptures. And in essence, he disobeys God. He's claiming he's disobedient now. Not just in the past, it's now. And I don't live up to the pure words of Christ evil. I don't, not I didn't, I don't live up to the pure words of Christ evil. And he has to correct that. Notice he calls the pure words of Christ evil subconsciously. It's not a slip. He is preaching the apostate gospel. It is evil. He will be anathematized for it. It's what it says here. Galatians. He knows that. I know he knows that. I've heard him quote this. But even if we, this is uh, Galatians 1.8, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. You say, well, I received the, that gospel from the evangelical churches. But Paul says what we preach. Then he says what you've received. Then he's speaking to the Galatians, what they received, not you. The gospel of Christ, he calls it just one or two verses before that. Any gospel that is preached that is not the gospel of Christ in the Bible, the one preaching it will be accursed. And Frank Turek is preaching another gospel. He must repent. Otherwise, he will be accursed. And I don't live up to the pure words of Christ evil either. I'm a hypocrite. Notice he's boasting about that. And this is kind of the comedy about it. Or it was at the beginning of the joke. But he's serious about it. And he's boastful about it. That's what's so disgusting. He's boastful about being a hypocrite. And I don't live up to the pure words of Christ evil either. I'm a hypocrite. And when people say I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on here, down, here Kyle, we for one more. It's a very old joke. Evangelical joke, right? Come on down, we've got room for one more. But that's not the message of Christ. That's not the message of Paul. That's not the message of the scriptures of conversion from your hypocrisy. To stop sinning, stop living as the world, stop living as you used to. Obey Jesus because he died because of you. Don't you feel anything about that? You say you're a Christian, but don't you feel any empathy for Jesus dying because of you? Because that's why he died is to use a defibrillator on your heart, to jumpstart your heart in empathy. That's all of his teachings, too. It's all about empathy and failure of empathy and what will happen to you. Let's keep going. Come on down, pal. We got room for one more. The church is a hospital for sinners. It's not a country club for saints. If it's a hospital for sinners, that means the sinners have to be healed. But if they're never being healed, as Frank is portraying here, that everyone continues to be a hypocrite sinning and never stops sinning, that's a pretty bad hospital, wouldn't you say? It's not a hospital at all, in fact. It's a place where people go to die without ever being healed. Hmm, what kind of place is that? Maybe a death camp? 
He only contrasts it with a country club. It's not a country club for saints. Like saints would be treating church like it's some sort of game. Something trivial, like a country club. See? There are all these subtle ways. I mean, this is, this is not his invention. He's only telling you what someone else created as a meme in the evangelical church in order to criticize really obeying what the Bible says. It's a very subtle way of using humor in order to cut your legs out from under you. The church is a hospital for sinners. I would agree with that, but the hospital actually cures the sinners. But in Frank's world, it doesn't. But it's not a country club for saints. But what he's saying by that is that, well, you know, calling the church a country club, everyone would agree that, well, the church is not supposed to be a country club, right? But he's throwing saints in there in order to malign the idea of stopping your sin or being clean of your sin. Saint means terrifyingly clean once. And if you can't be terrifyingly clean, because saints would be at a country club and country clubs in the church would be wrong, and there are no saints in church, is the conclusion. There, no one in the church is terrifyingly clean. No one has been clean and cleansed from their sin, but then that undermines the blood of Jesus Christ. Because 1 John 1, 7 says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, literally purges us in the Greek, from all sin. So what Frank has done is he set it up so that you don't believe in the cleansing power of Jesus' blood. Now you see how treacherous it is. In fact, when people say, when, there's a couple of saints right here. Then he makes a joke about saints right here. Another joke about saints. Listen. When people say, I can't go to church because there's too many hypocrites down there, it would be like saying, I can't go to the gym because there's too many out of shape people down there. But if he says that, well, but, you know, the church is full of hypocrites because no one can stop their sin. That means there, there's nothing else but hypocrites, sir. But if you compare that to the gym, there's nothing but out of shape people at the gym. That's not true. It's absolutely not true. So why would you make this parallel, Frank? It's a very bad parallel. It gets a laugh. That's why. He does it just to get a quick laugh in order to make them bring their card down even more and even more so he can slip in more of this heresy. Second Peter, I've quoted this before to you, where it talks about slipping in heresy. These false teachers. Second Peter 2. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the Lord who bought them. I just proved it to you that he's denying the blood of Jesus and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. It says in the Greek, many will take up for themselves those heresies and will be on the same road as them out from us. And that's what Frank is trying to do. He's trying to slip in these heresies, bringing down your guard. It's one of the reasons you're going to the gym. It's one of the reasons you're coming to church. So he said that this is one of the reasons you're going to church is because you're a hypocrite. Well, but he doesn't believe that the church can cure you of your hypocrisy. He himself said it about himself. Because if the church could, then why is he still a hypocrite? According to his own confession right there. So he believes it's a country club for hypocrites. That's what he believes it is. That's what he's described. Come on down, we got room for one more. And why wouldn't you go there? That's a place for hypocrites. But he's still a hypocrite, meaning that the church that at least he goes to cannot cure his hypocrisy. So it's a country club then. See, I told you, sleight of hand. Father was a hypocrite. Dead during the worship, you know, a lot of times people have trouble imagining a heavenly father because their earthly father was a hypocrite. Earthly father's been a jerk. I get it. We're all fallen. None of us are perfect. 
But I want to ask you a question. If you've had somebody in your life who claims to be a Christian and that has turned you off because of what they did or how they conducted themselves, here's the question. When somebody plays Beethoven poorly, who do you blame? Who do you blame? You don't blame Beethoven. When somebody plays Jesus poorly, who do you blame? You don't blame Jesus. We're not playing Jesus. Now, obviously, he's trying to make a point that if the person that you're following, who calls himself a Christian, fails or sins, you can't blame Jesus for that failure or that sin. He should say that. But instead, he's playing games again with sleight of hand so that he can slip in his heresy. These false teachers use some true elements, but then they do this sleight of hand to distort things around, just keep points in those things, so that you go, well, that's almost correct, but there's something off, but I can't put my finger on it. Well, I just did. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, by the way. He also said, awake to righteousness and do not sin. I say this to your shame because some are without the knowledge of God. Frank doesn't believe that. That's exactly what the Bible says. But Frank doesn't believe that. Otherwise, he would stop sinning. He'd awake to righteousness and stop sinning. He would not criticize people for following other Christians who follow Jesus. His answer is that, well, don't criticize Jesus when a Christian happens to fail who you know, who maybe even you're looking up to. That doesn't address the Christians who do follow Christ and do not fail and do not fall back into sin, and you are following them. Doesn't address any of those. Let's keep going with what else he has to say. Doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Just because your dad wasn't true and beautiful doesn't mean Jesus isn't true and beautiful. Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Not true. Christianity is Jesus and Christians because Christians are the church, the bride of Christ. And Jesus loves the bride of Christ. And every marriage a symbol of Jesus and the church. Ephesians chapter 5, 22. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own Husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. How did Jesus give himself for the church? Think about that, husbands. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should she should be holy and without blemish. Holy. That's terrifyingly clean. That same word is saint, but the adjective. Without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of Jesus' body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, Christianity is not just, of, is not just Christ. It absolutely is not. And I just proved it right there. What is Christ if he has no one that he gave himself for? Christ and the church, his body. We are the body of Jesus on the earth now. So if Christianity is Christ, it is also the church and Christians. Frank has a very distorted, wrong, apostate view of the gospel, of the teachings in the New Testament. He doesn't understand what it teaches. And it's in plain sight in the scriptures. So what he's doing is he's filtering for the evangelical culture. And he's trying to suppress things 
and replace him with his means. You hear how many people said amen? Newsflash, Christianity is not Christians. Christianity is Jesus. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus, another evangelical phrase. You know that? It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. The idea is not in the Bible. Like I said, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That means Paul told them to keep their eyes on him as he keeps his eyes on Christ. That's not what Frank is saying. Frank is wrong. Because God is right. And God wrote that. Frank is wrong. Frank is an enemy of God and an enemy of the cross. So, there you have it. Frank Turek is a false teacher who is set against Christ and against God, who preaches the apostate gospel, part of the apostate church. He is anathema. He's accursed because he's preaching another gospel. And you saw all of the sleight of hand he's doing, right and left. So stay away from Frank Turek. But what I wanted you to see is how this is so infused, his teaching and his phrases are so infused with the evangelical culture and how it replaces the scriptures. How, how much did he quote from the scriptures there? Did he quote anything from the Bible? Not a thing. There wasn't anything quoted from the Bible. But I quoted you many things. I referred you to many places in the scriptures so that you have grounding against his evangelical culture. This is going to give you a lot to think about. You've got to start thinking, how much of this evangelical culture have I absorbed? Am I using to suppress what is actually just written plainly right there in the scriptures? Because that's how it works. And you really have to work through that. Ask God to show this to you, to reveal this to you, and to help uproot it out of you. Because if you don't, you will not be saved. You're following a false gospel. Now, I said that we were going to go ahead and read a chapter from Romans. So let me pull that up here. Romans 2. This is the New King James Version, as you can see. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. You judge the things that you're practicing also. So you're judging yourself. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. So Paul is saying, indeed those things are wrong. But God's judgment is according to truth because God does not do those things. But he's not saying that they cannot help but do those things. He's saying they shouldn't. And you'll see that come up as we go. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? So there he says that they must stop that. Because if they don't stop doing those things that they judge others for doing, God will judge them for that. They're judging others, but not judging themselves and stopping it. And so while they're judging others, and others are learning to stop it, unless they deceive them and tell them they can't stop it, they themselves are not stopping it. And therefore, when they reach the end of this life, and they are in the judgment day, they will be condemned by God. This is a book to Christians. The book of Romans is to Christians. This is talking about that transition from the second to third stage of salvation I've told you about. The first stage is what everyone blurs to say that's all of the salvation. That's salvation out of the whole collection of individuals called the world. But then, once we've been saved out of the world, we're expected to stop sinning. That happens by the blood of Jesus, through the empathy of the cross that is infused into us. So that's the second stage of salvation. And John talks about it extensively in chapter 2 of 1 John. He says, My dear children, I write these things to you so that you may not sin. That's to the infants. My dear children, those are infants, literally, in the faith. Not literal infants, but it means infants. 
those who are newbies in the faith. They're expected to stop sinning. It doesn't mean that they automatically will, and if they don't, they're not saved. It's not like that. It, because it says, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father on our behalf, the righteous Jesus Christ. But then it goes on to describe young men who have overcome the evil one. And it says in the next chapter that sin is of the devil. So overcoming the evil one means overcoming sin. So you've got it pretty clear that there are three stages of salvation, because the third one is the judgment day itself, which Jesus talk, talks about in Matthew 25, his last teaching before he goes to the cross. And that's the third salvation, third stage of salvation. It's one great salvation, but there are three stages. You're saved out of the whole collection of individuals called the world and their culture. Then you're saved from sin and sins. And then you're saved into eternal life. All right. So then it says here <clears throat> that you will escape the judgment of God. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Meaning they're not repenting. And that's what salvation is for, for you to repent of your sins. Remember, repentance means metanoia, exercise the mind in the midst of the occasion the rest of your life, every occasion. Don't you know that God's patience, that he puts up with your sins so long, isn't just to ignore your sins and let you just go on in them. The point is for repentance, that you would come to your senses and stop doing it, then it says, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, that means your unrepentant heart, your heart that refuses to repent, in accordance with the hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, his actions, literally is what it means. Again, it comes back to actions, not faith. Faith is what carries us out of the world, and faith carries us through overcoming sin. But when we get into the part of overcoming sin, that faith produces those actions, a stopping sin and doing what's right. So that's why he says, who will render to each one according to his actions. This is to Christians. Eternal life to those who, so now we're into the third stage of salvation. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good. That's good works. Doing good is good works, is good actions. Actions of good. Eternal life to those. If you're not patiently continuing to do good, you will not receive eternal life. That's what he says. Who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. You're doing good deeds in order to obtain glory, honor, and immortality. And if you're doing that and continue to patiently, then when God judges everyone according to his deeds, he will give you eternal life. That's what it says. Read it. It's right there on your screen. Read it. Say, so where is it? Starting in verse 6. Who will render to each one according to his deeds? Verse 7. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, do not obey the truth, like Frank Turek, who claims to be a hypocrite, claims that he doesn't obey Jesus' words. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. He obeys unrighteousness. He even glories in it, saying that he is a hypocrite and he doesn't obey the words of Jesus. A hypocrite exactly obeys unrighteousness. Otherwise, you would not be a hypocrite. But look, it calls Frank Turek self-seeking. He's not given himself up for Christ. Because if he had, then he would be in the first group. But it goes further. It says, But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, 
but obey of righteousness, this is what God will give to them. Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, who does good deeds. And he says, for there is no partiality with God, because he's saying, first to the Jew, then to the Greek, for, for both punishment and reward. And some say, oh, see, it's just rewards, it's not eternal life. No, eternal life is the reward. Verse 7, eternal life to those who, by patient continuance and doing good, get it? And Jesus, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, doesn't breathe a word about faith. Doesn't mean faith isn't important. It's absolutely critical. But Jesus judges there based solely on their deeds. So for you to say, well, we're not saved by deeds, we're not saved by works, is a lie. We are condemned by our own works, but we are saved by the works that God has custom fit us to walk all about in. Does that ring a bell? That's Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 actually says that we are saved by faith and works. Because faith leads us into those works. And if we're not led into those works and do those works, the faith isn't really there. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. That's not exactly what it says. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Well, you can't say that you're boasting because of God's works. I mean, you could, but that's not what this means. This means bad boasting. Because God doesn't want you to do it. He says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He wants you to boast in His works. But this is not His works, this is your works. You're not saved from your own works, what you think you should do. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Notice they're called good works here, and before it's just called works. Verse 9, not of works. It doesn't say not of good works. And yet, those who believe that works have nothing to do with our salvation will say, oh look, we're not saved by good works. No, this is not of works. Then it says here, for good works, in verse 10, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now that verse in itself doesn't say that we're saved by those good works. But when you look at these other passages, it's inevitable. Because they say so. Right here. Read it again, because you still can't believe it. You're probably in great shock. Who will render according... To each one according to his deeds, works, actions. Same word in Greek. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good. If you're doing good, those are actions and works. By doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. And you will be given that eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, when you say, I don't need to obey Christ, he can be my Savior, but he's not my Lord. I don't have to make him my Lord to be saved. It's not true. It says, those who do not obey the truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. And if you say, I don't need to obey Jesus, you're saying that you're in this second group. Because you do not obey the truth. Jesus Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. You cannot come to the Father except by Jesus, the truth. And this says, those who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, and you say, I can't help but sin as long as I'm in the body. Sin is unrighteousness. If you are obeying unrighteousness, that means sinning, you will receive indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, but those who are, by patient continuance in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, they will receive glory, honor, and peace. 
to everyone who works what is good. And that God will not show partiality. You cannot say, well, but I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. And so God is going to show partiality with you and not judge you based on your actions. This says the opposite. Verse 11, for there is no partiality with God. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew. Doesn't matter if you're Abraham's child. Doesn't matter if you're Jesus' follower named a Christian. Everyone will be judged according to their actions, their deeds, their works. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. You know what the law says about sin. There is punishment for it, and many of them end in death. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Does that ring a bell? Where James, Jacob is his real name, says, Do not be just listeners, but be doers of the law. The perfect law of liberty, he says. You will only be blessed by doing, he says. That's what it says. This is saying the same thing from Paul. For Paul says, it's not the ones who are able to hear the law. When you sit in church and you listen to it, or you turn on a YouTube channel and you listen to it, and you understand it and you agree with it, that does not make you righteous. That's what he's saying. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be considered just. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or ex else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Notice that those Gentiles are not hypocrites. They're not. They're doing what is on their conscience and on their hearts that they know is true. Paul says that those who are doing that will be justified. It says, for, it says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Sounds like Frank Turek. Yeah, that's how he promotes himself. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. And you probably think of yourself that way also. You can replace the word Jew with Christian here. You can replace the word law with gospel here. And you get an interesting parallel. And it would still be true. You therefore who teach another, do, not, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who say... Stay away from pornography. Do you secretly use pornography? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who abhor idols, do you call the Bible the word of God and commit idolatry? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. If you call the Bible the word of God, you're calling it God. Only Jesus is the word of God. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. And you say, well, but that's about the Jews and the law. 
You think so? It's not only about that. This letter was not written to the Jews. It was written to the Christians at Rome. Now, there were a lot of Jews in the church who were Christians, because before Cornelius' household, all Christians were Jews. You probably not, didn't know that. I don't know. Verse 25, it says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. Physical circumcision. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision, meaning you are not a son of Abraham, of the promise. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, a physically uncircumcised man, keeps the requirements of the law, righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physical, physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? You've got the law, you know what it says, and yet you are a transgressor of it, it says. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So, the question is, what about the heart? Are you circumcised in the heart? Just obeying with the members of your body, he's saying it's not enough. Which is what Jesus clarified when he filled up what was lacking. Matthew 5, 17. So Frank Turek thinks that you can be a hypocrite, and it's okay. That you can be breaking the commands of Jesus, and it's okay. That you can be disobeying God, and it's okay. That it's okay to be a hypocrite. It's normal that everyone's a hypocrite, and no one can stop their hypocrisy. That's what he said. What does this say, though? This even posits that someone who's uncircumcised can end up obeying the law. This also posits that someone outside of the community of faith can also follow what is on their heart and their conscience and end up standing in judgment against you because you're a hypocrite. Now, hypocrisy is absolutely rejected in this chapter. And especially at the very beginning there that I read to you in detail about God's judgment to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who a patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. You cannot be a hypocrite and get away with it. God will punish you, and you will not receive eternal life. Because eternal life is given to those who by patient continuance in doing good but to those who do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness and do evil, it says, not eternal life, indignation, wrath, tribulation, anguish. So you can see that Frank Turek is an absolute apostate, false teacher, deceiving people into receiving the apostate gospel and being condemned. May the Lord bless you as you seek him with all your heart.